with each one of us, Lord. Uh, you know us better than we know ourselves, God. You know how to draw us and how to talk to us and, and, and every intricate thing that needs to be done, God. You know how to do it. So, God, I just ask that you do it tonight, God. I ask for freedom in everybody's life here. Chains, walls, broken. God, I, I just pray, Lord, that uh, uh, tonight in the message and in the worship time and in the small groups, Lord, that uh, you just have your will and your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, I was at the county jail, I guess it was last Sunday, and uh, I went in there, me and Butch Potts and Thomas Minor, and I preached a message, and I couldn't get that message off my mind, so I had to share it here tonight. And uh, so about about a year ago or so, uh, it was summertime, real good fishing weather. Is anybody in here, fishers, like to go fishing? A lot of us, so this, this y'all can relate to this story probably. Uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Tommy Shear, and me and him, we decided that we was going to go fishing and have a competition. So uh, I grew up in Shirley, and uh, right next to William McDowell's property, he had a big old pond on there, and and uh, we knew that it was overstocked, a bunch of small bass, not a whole lot of big bass, but they were real hungry. And so we decided we're going to have a competition. So we go, we get out there, and... Uh, just pretty much as quick as we're throwing uh, our, our rod and reel, throwing that lure out there into the water, we're catching the bass almost instantly. So we're having to really rush and really hurry to try to, we're up in the 30s and the 40s on how many fish we've caught, and we're neck and neck. And, and so I'm really rushing. I had a, a top water lure, and it had a treble hook on both ends. And uh, y'all know these lures. It was one of the smaller topwaters, you know. And so the, the hook on it, a treble hook has three hooks, and it's barbed. So that means it's sharp on both ends. One to go in you, the fish's mouth, and, and, and one to keep it from coming out. And uh, so I, I threw it out there, caught a fish, I reeled it in. And two of the hooks out of the three on this treble hook had got into the fish's mouth and it was real difficult to get out so in my rush I got the other treble hook stuck into my finger and it went in it, it went in past the barb so it, it wouldn't come out without it ripping my my skin and cutting me and causing me a lot of pain and to bleed a little bitty tiny hook small hook I found that at that moment that small hook had control of my whole body Right? You know, that's all I could focus on. That's all I could think about. It had my attention. And uh, so uh, Tommy was over there. He was still just, he just catching them and throwing them in. He's laughing. <laughs> you know, he thinks, he don't know what I'm doing. And I said, Tommy, I need you to help me. And he said, nah, you ain't getting me with that one. He thought I was trying to pull a fast one on him. And I was like, no, man, please. Please, I need you. Please, come help me. I'm begging. This, this fish, every time it started moving, that hook would go deeper. I knew that if I didn't get that hook out, you know, it was going to cause me even more pain the deeper it went. And, and it was going to cause me more pain pulling it out. I had to get the hook out because if I didn't, it would cause an infection. I had to get the hook out because if I didn't, down the road somewhere along the way, I might end up losing my finger. That infection might run through my entire bloodstream, causing my whole body to get sick. That little thing, it had to be taken care of quickly. Otherwise, it could have caused a lot of damage to me. So Tommy come over there, and, uh, and he just started laughing at me. He looked at it, he thought it was funny, you know. Uh, he has a sense of humor like that, but... Uh, I said, Tommy, please help me. So he grabs that fish and he just squeezes it to death. And so it stopped flopping and I got it on the ground. I got the hooks out of the, the fish and then I cut the line. So I just had the hook in my finger and I thought, okay, I got to do it. I knew it was going to hurt. 
I knew it was going to rip my flesh. I knew I was going to bleed, but I knew that was the only way I could get it out, the only way that I, I was ever going to have a wound that was going to heal. So I ripped that sucker out, and, uh, and the other day, when I, when, before I went to go preach at the jail, the other day, when I was sitting there wondering what I was going to preach on, uh, I remember looking at my hands and, and wondering which finger it was that that hook was in, because I can't remember. It's healed that well, you know, where that, that, that cut was. It's healed that well. I can't even remember which finger it was in. And then, uh, and then it took me to a, a scripture in the Bible uh, that correlates with what happened to me in real life. And I think it will correlate with a lot of us. So we'll go to, we're going to go to the story where Abram and Lot and Sarai, they left. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 12, verse, starting in verse 1. And I want y'all to y'all think about this as I'm, as I'm going through this scripture. I want y'all to think about the story I told you about what actually happened to me also. See. So Genesis 12, we'll start in verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. I want you all to pay attention to that. Lot went with Abram. Okay? And we'll, we'll scroll on down here to verse 11 in chapter 12. No, let's go to 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a, one, a woman of beautiful countenance. And he's doing good right there, you know. Nothing wrong with telling your wife she's beautiful. But right after that, he messes up. He says, Therefore... It will happen when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. So, here we got Abram, Lot, and Sarai. Uh, they, they have just gone into Egypt, but right before they got into Egypt, uh, Abram's telling his wife, I want you to pretend to be my sister so they don't kill me. And they can just have their way with you. You know, that's pretty messed up. And, and Lot's there, he's a, he's a part of it. You know, he's not the one talking to Sarai, but he's a part of it. He goes into Egypt. We know Egypt at that time uh, had many false gods, sun god, moon god. They had many rituals, pagan rituals. So here, Lot's with them in Egypt. He's exposed to all this lifestyle, and this is important for the message that I'm preaching. So we know that he was there. He was exposed to it all. Okay? We'll move on. In verse 1 in chapter 13, it says, Then Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, to the south. So here again, Lot's leaving Egypt with Abram and his wife. And here, here we're going to get to the meat of the reason why I said that. In verse, in verse, uh, we'll just read from verse 2. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold, 
and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. So here they are. They're in this place. Abram's got a, a ton of livestock. He's rich. Lot, Abram's nephew, he's got a ton of livestock. He's rich, but the land that they're in at that particular spot is not big enough to sustain both of the herds. And on top of that, the people that worked for Abram and the people that worked for Lot, they weren't getting along, you know, and that was causing problems. So here they are, and, and Abram is wanting to diffuse the situation. He wants to make sure that his livestock can, that, that they can get the food they need, the water they need, and so, and for Lot also. And he don't want his workers fighting with their workers. He's trying to diffuse everything. So he says, Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right, or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. Verse 10 is very important. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. So, this is what I think. I think that Lot was given opportunity to choose wherever he wanted to go. And he looked around, and he, he, he gazed over there in the direction where Sodom was located. And he saw, it reminded him of Egypt, where he had been, where Sarai had pretended to be Abram's sister, where she went to the Pharaoh's house, where there was false gods, rituals, pagan activity. And, and Lot saw this, and that's what he chose. I think that Lot inwardly got hooked when he was in Egypt, and he had not never had that hook removed. And when he, saw, when he saw Sodom, the inward desire, just like some of us got hooked with alcohol. Some of us got hooked with that party lifestyle. Weed, meth, anger, selfishness, envy, all kinds of sin. We got hooked. And, and even though we've left it behind, we get along the journey somewhere and we look up and we open our eyes and we see something that reminds us of that thing that's still in us, that hook. And we do, a lot of times, what Lot, what Lot did, what Lot chose to do. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of the Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. So that's not, you know probably that big a deal, people would say. But I think it's a very big deal. He sees Sodom. He's off in the distance. He has pitched his tent, all of his workers' tents, his livestock, and he's faced his, his tent door towards the city. He's not in the city. He's just looking at the city. Right? That don't seem like that big a deal. Just like that little hook in my finger. don't seem like that big a deal, but it had control of me. I had to do something about it. And so here's Lot. He's got his tent facing Sodom. He's watching things. He's living his life. He's doing things. What happens next? What happens next? In, the, in Scripture, where do we see him? It 
It says he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom, listen, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. This is what Lot saw. This is what attracted Lot. Exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram after Lot had separated from him, Okay, we're going to move on. That's not part of my message. We're going to chapter 19. Okay, chapter 19, verse 1. This is where we, we see Lot. You know, from, from back in chapter 13, now we're in chapter 19. He was, he was camping out, his tents, livestock, his workers were camping out on the hill. Sodom's over here. He can see it. He's got his tent in that direction. And then now, uh, several chapters down the road, it says two angels come to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. What does that mean, sitting in the gate? That means back in that day, when you were sitting in the gate, that's where all the leaders of a city gathered together. So when the angels found Lot, Lot was sitting in the gate. Lot had found himself to be a leader in the city. He had been camping outside, just looking at the city, but now he's a leader in the city. All because he let that little hook stay in, and it went a little deeper. And it's a little harder to get out. And when Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said... Here now, my lords, please turn to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house of Lot. Everybody. Everybody knew these two men, seen them come in, and they all decided to come. They knew they, they were in Lot's house, and they all decided to come and surround the city. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Carnally, that means they wanted to know them in a sexual way. All of the men in the entire city surrounded Lot's house and wanted to know him, these two men, in a sexual way. This is the place that Lot had chosen to be a leader at. This is the place that Lot had pitched his tent towards. This little hook is getting deep and deep. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. So Lot's answer to this problem is a, is a very stupid answer, right? These men surrounded his house, and they wanted to know these these two men in a carnal way, in a sexual way, and Lot's answer is, is well, don't please don't take them. Take my two virgin daughters. Now what kind of answer is that? That hook has got so deep into Lot that his thinking isn't even right. Has the hook ever got so deep into us that it messed up our thinking? We made decisions in our life that were just stupid? It all started with that little hook. It didn't just happen from one day to the next. It was a progressive thing. Anywhere along the way, Lot could have said, God, remove this hook from me. But it don't stop there. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with him. So they pressed hard against the man Lot, 
and came near to breaking down the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. But the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. Take them out of this place. Take this, for, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has great, grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. So Lot had become so perverse. He had gone so far away from where God had intended him to be. That little hook had gotten so deep that it had, it had in, gotten, turned into an infection and spread throughout his whole body that even his own close personal family wouldn't believe him concerning the things of the Lord. Have we ever done anything? Has a hook ever gone so deep in our life that it wasn't just hurting us anymore, but it was hurting our family and our friends? What happened to all of Lot's workers that was with him? They all went into that city too. Somebody had to tend the livestock. Lot had an impact on many, many people because of what he allowed to be in his life. When the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. Two angels, had to, they had to grab him up, grab his daughters up and his wife up, and drag them up out of that city. They done told him, God's going to destroy the city. If I've got two angels coming to me telling me, you need to leave this place. I'm not going to be lingering. Hopefully, I don't want to linger, you know. Uh, but here Lot is lingering. He had to get drug up out of the city. That's how deep the hook was. So it came to pass when they had brought them outside that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please know my lords. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. And we're going to skip on down to save time. Verse 26, But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. So here, here uh, Lot's losing his wife, you know, physically. But I think that's also a picture of us. When we, when we are, are getting out of something and we look back, we can become like a pillar of salt, useless to the Lord. When our, when our eyes and, and our entirety is, is focused on, on this, this negativity, this sinful thing, uh, we're not giving our attention and focus to God where God's telling us to go. And it just makes us useless. So Lot's lost his wife now. He could have prevented that by keeping her away from that city. Verse 30, Then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains, and his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on earth to come in to us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him. 
that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. So here we see, again, Lot messing up. He, he gets so drunk, he could have said, no, I'm not drinking. But he gets so drunk that his daughters are able to go in there and rape him. It says they didn't know, he didn't know when they came in or when they left. And, and I think that means, I've, in my life, I've been so drunk that I've woke up in places and not know how I got there. Probably some of y'all have. Couldn't remember what I did the last few hours of the night. Been so messed up. So Lot found himself in that situation and some very bad things happened to him. And what I want to show you is this. It didn't, it didn't just all happen all of a sudden like this. It all started whenever he looked around, he saw something that was a hook on the inside that hadn't been removed. So he pitched his tent. You know, any of us ever said, just one more beer or... I'm just going to go get drunk one more time. Uh, one more pack of cigarettes. Uh, this one girl, is, you know, just one more time outside of marriage, one more affair, one more time, and that's it. Uh, I'm going to act on anger this last time, and then I'm going to be done with it. You know, how many of us had, have pitched our tent? You know, the Bible says that we are the, the temple of God. We are His house. Right? And where we pitch our house toward is, is what our inward man or woman is focused on. So where, where is our tent, our tent, our house, where is it set? Where is, where is the door of our house focused on? It's a serious thing. If it's focused on the wrong things, it may not be that bad right now. But the longer it stays focused on it, you might wake up one day and be sitting at the gate. A leader in this, this sinful town and your family, your friends, drawn up in it too, affected by your decisions. And the good news is, is that hook can be removed. That hook don't have to stay in there. And we don't have to remove it. We just have to trust God enough. We've got a God who's, who's loving, who forgives us, who created us in His own image. He wants to make us like Him. He wants to fill us with power. He wants to make us overcomers. He wants to encourage us. He wants to walk with us, stand behind us, go before us. He's omnipresent, omnipotent. There's nothing He can't do, nothing He won't do for His children. That's what we've got. I had to pull the hook out of my finger by myself. But if we rest in Him, if we trust in Him, if we give it over to Him, God will remove it. Right? Just like if I, if I didn't remove the hook out of my finger, my finger still would not be healed. It could not heal with that hook in my finger. Spiritually, we cannot be healed without allowing God to remove that hook from us. Whatever it is. If it's drugs, if it's alcohol, if it's sexual uh, misconduct in, in many various different ways, if, whatever it may be, if we don't allow God to remove that hook, then we cannot ever expect to be healed. So, uh, we've got to analyze ourselves. We've got to look in, into ourselves and into our life, and we've got to find out where, where is our house. Where, where, we are the house of God. Where are we pointing? What are we pointing to? And, uh, and I believe that there's people even in this room tonight that need healing. There's people even in this room tonight that have got little hooks in them, and maybe they're even big hooks. Maybe they're real deep right now, but nothing's too deep for God. The Apostle Paul was going around killing folk, doing some bad things to people. And God chose to, to utilize that guy to do some pretty miraculous things.
You're not too far gone for God. Right? So, I thank you all for coming tonight. I talked longer than I, I intended to, but uh, uh, I love y'all, and I hope that that I hope that goes carries forward with y'all. You know, think about the little hook. You know, it's easy to see a hook that's real deep, but think about that little hook. Don't get hooked. <laughs>